Hey everyone, in this lecture, we're going to be recapping igneous rocks, and then we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite subjects, volcanoes. So first, let's talk about what we learned last lecture. Magma is liquid rock under the Earth's surface. This is usually in the acenosphere. And igneous rocks are formed by the solidifying or freezing of that magma. The melt viscosity depends on composition. And we have two different types of igneous rocks. We have intrusive and extrusive. And the magma occurs in different compositions. Uh, we talked about what those words are. Those are felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. And these um, are basically identifiers of the, the mineral composition of the rock. Igneous rocks are classified according to its texture and composition. Plate tectonics can explain why igneous rocks form where they do. And igneous rocks can be found at um, hotspots, subduction zones, mid-ocean ridges, and rifts. So this is um, a, a summary again of the different rock textures. So for the composition, we have felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. And these ultimately correspond to different mineral compositions. And we have um, grain size, so fine grain and coarse grain. And these are the most common um, igneous rocks that we have. So the texture describes the size, shape, and arrangement of the crystals. And generally speaking, slower cooling magma has coarser grained. And faster cooling magma has finer grained. So here are some more examples of those different rock textures. Aphanetic igneous rocks are very fine grained. When we look at this rock, uh, you can't really pick out any individual grains um, just to the naked eye. But if we were to look much closer over with a hand lens, you'd be able to see that they're all very small. The crystals that comprise them cannot be distinguished by the naked eye. So this rock is called aphanitic. Um, and that's quite different than this texture, which is phaneritic. And phaneritic igneous rocks are coarse grained, consisting of massive intergrown crystals of roughly equivalent size that can be identified without the aid of hand lens or microscope. So all of these grains are much larger than those in the aphanitic texture. You can see here that they're all roughly the same. So that would describe phaneritic texture. And here's an example of porphyritic igneous rocks, and they have two different size crystals. You see here in this example of some andesite, you have really large crystals next to some that are quite small. The larger crystals are termed phenocrysts, and the smaller ones surrounding them um, are called ground mass. And the most coarse grained of all the textures is pegmatitic and these are very coarse grained. Individual crystals of a pegmatitic rock can exceed one centimeter. So each of these little blocks here represents a grain. Okay, and the last few uh, is vesicular. And this texture here on the top right, vesicular texture results from um, gas bubbles that are being trapped within the magma as it's cooled. And below here is the glassy texture. And this is when um, it's basically frozen uh, in, into one ordered crystal structure. And uh, pyroclastic igneous rocks are composed of particles or fragments rather than interlocking crystals. And they are produced by explosive volcanism. So when we talk about a pyroclastic flow, those are usually produced by an explosive event. So like I said, igneous rocks can be divided into four broad categories based on their proportion of, generally speaking, light and dark materials. So the lighter it is, the more felsic a rock is. Generally speaking, the darker color it is, the more mafic or ultramafic it is. And an example of a more felsic rock would be like a, a granite and a more mafic rock would be basalt. Felsic rocks have a higher proportion of light colored silicates like quartz and feldspars. And mafic rocks have a higher proportion of those darker colored silicates like amphiboles and pyroxenes and calcium rich plagioclase. And so here's that diagram uh, just in a different way. So if you're referring to a different textbook, this might look familiar to you. So again, if we have felsic, these generally have 
uh, more potassium feldspar and quartz minerals, and ultramafic is generally uh, composed more of olivine and pyroxene. And uh, this chart also shows um, the difference in temperature. So the temperature at which melting begins. So this, uh, this is generally um, cooler and these are generally hotter, more silica in felsic rocks than ultramafic rocks. Okay, let me move my face. In, uh, in, this, in this slide here, again, this is where we're looking at the dominant minerals for these, uh, for these different types of rocks here. So quartz and uh, potassium feldspar, we usually see in a granite or a rhyolite. And uh, the darker, more mafic and ultramafic minerals like pyroxene and olivine, uh, these are associated with basalt or um, peridotite. And this, um, this also incorporates textures. So this is a really handy chart when trying to identify igneous rocks. And it shows that generally uh, the only one with glassy texture is obsidian. And if you have pyroclastic or fragmental textures, those could either be tufts or breccias. Uh, this is a handy way of trying to identify igneous rocks. Okay, so igneous rocks, um, comprise the, uh, so sorry, rocks that comprise the continental crust are generally felsic. Rocks that comprise oceanic crust are generally mafic. And rocks in the mantle are generally ultra mafic. Okay, so Bowen's reaction series, this is in the textbook if you're following along. Uh, this provides visual representat representation of the order in which minerals crystallize from a magma of average composition and minerals that form in the same general temperature regime of, of a Bowen's reaction series are often found together in, in these rocks. And the Bowen's reaction series illustrates how a single magma can generate more than one kind of igneous rock, depending on how uh, fast or slowly it cools. And the reaction series predicts the sequence of mineral melting in a rock undergoing heating. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so this is Bowen's reaction series. And this is yet another way to look at different igneous rocks. So again, here's uh, at high temperatures, this is the first to crystallize. We see generally more ultramafic. Um, those are high in olivine. So this is the mineral that you would see at high temperatures. And at lower temperatures, last to crystallize, we see things like quartz and muscovite mica, potassium feldspar, and these are more associated with the felsic composition. So again, these are uh, this is just another way to look at the correlation between temperatures and mineral composition and textures to identify igneous rocks. Okay, now let's talk about volcanoes. So in this lecture, we're going to well, we're going to discuss how lava flow is dependent on viscosity. We're going to talk about the four major types of volcanoes, cinder cone, shield, composite, or stratovolcano, and lava dome. Uh, there's two main eruption types, um, effusive and explosive. Uh, different kinds of volcanoes form in different geologic settings. Um, like we discussed um, with plate tectonics theory. So we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit more detail. And of course, volcanoes pose many hazards. Uh, we're gonna give, go over some of those examples and see some YouTube videos. And volcanoes exist on other planets. And there's lots of all uh, active volcanoes in the world right now. You may not necessarily know it, but um, there's always, always volcanic activity going on. Okay, so what is a volcano? A volcano is a rupture in the crust of a planetary mass object, such as the Earth, that allows hot lava, volcanic ash, and gases to escape from a magma chamber below the surface. So my definition has uh, Earth in there because um, volcanoes exist on other planets too. So I'm going to give you an example of that at the end of the lecture. So what are the, the products of a volcanic eruption? Well, we have lava flows, which is here. We have volcanoclastic deposits, and we have volcanic gas and aerosols. 
So the last two are a result of eruption here. So um, as the explosion settles, those would be volcanic classic deposits. And of course, um, during an eruption, we have volcanic gas and aerosols. So let's first talk about lava flows. These are typically basalt and they have very low viscosity. So um, steep slopes near the summit volcano can move at speeds up to 30 kilometers per hour, um, but it slows down to a walking pace after it starts to cool. So right near uh, the source of where the volcano is erupting, it can be quite fast, but of course the further away it gets and uh, the more surface area it has, um, it has a chance to cool and slow down. Flows measure less than a few kilometers, but some have extended tens of kilometers from the source. Uh, molten lava moves only through tunnel-like passageways or lava tubes within the flow. So if you haven't had a chance to see a basalt flow, um, here's a really interesting video. And this is kind of like watching a campfire, like you just can't look away. So uh, just a word of caution, if you start watching some of these YouTube videos, you can really go down a rabbit hole and watch a lot of basalt flows. So let's check this one out. So there's different ways that we can describe uh, basalt lava flows, even though generically they're considered a lava flow. Uh, and we can do that based on the surface. And the surface of the flow depends on the timing of the lava's freezing relative to its movement. Uh, so first we have Pahoho, and this is when the basalt flows surfaces are warm and creates these wrinkles into smooth, glassy, rope-like ridges, which is the picture here on the top right. We have Aa, uh -uh, 
which is lava flow becomes too viscous to contort into ropes and the surface breaks into sharp angular fragments like this one, um, sort of like this. Uh, this is actually an example of the pillow lava and that typically forms underwater and cools very quickly. So we have new lava blobs that form and then a, a pillow breaks through and cools into a new blob. And last we have columnar jointing. Um, so even after a flow stops moving, it's still warm and it takes quite a while for that to cool all completely. So the rock shrinks as it loses heat and then fractures. And in some cases, the pattern of jointing outlines polygonal uh, columns. So here's an example of that in the bottom right hand corner. It, um, looking at columnar jointing in person is quite, quite crazy because it looks so geometric that you'd never think that it's totally natural, naturally formed that way. So let's look at andesitic and rhyolitic lava flows. And in, for these types of flows, um, lava does not flow as easily because it has a great viscosity. Andesitic lava first forms a mound above a vent and then advances slowly down the volcano's flank at about one to five meters per day. And as a result, blocky lava forms in angular chunks and looks like a jumble of rubble as opposed to those smooth sheets that we saw with lava flows. Rhyolitic lava is the most viscous of all lava because it has the most felsic uh, composition. And it's formed when a spire is above the vent and it's created when lava freezes while it's still the vent is being pushed upwards. So that's why we get this really chunky look. So let's look at an example of um, some andesitic lava flow. So that last video I showed you was an eruption from Mount Etna. And it was not too long ago that my friend texted me and was like, oh, did you know that Mount Etna is erupting again? I'm like, yeah, obviously. Like Mount Etna is one of those volcanoes that erupts all the time. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, my friends text me when volcanoes erupt because they're good friends. Okay, so let's talk about the characteristics of lava flow. And it's dependent on viscosity. So I've mentioned this before. So the less viscous the flow is, the more basaltic or the more sheet-like and smooth it is. So when we have a lava fountain with a basaltic flow, like the first video I showed you from Hawaii, it creates these long and very thin sheets. And uh, the more viscous it is, like we have an andesitic flow, this is where it gets the, the billowing and it breaks up as it flows. And the most viscous is um, the rhyolitic. And this is where we have uh, a flow coming up through a rhyolitic dome and it, it kind of mounds on itself. And the felsic lava is so viscous that it may pile up and create this dome shaped mass. Okay, so let's talk about volcanoclastic deposits such as pyroclastic debris. So basaltic melt rises from a volcano and that may contain dissolved volatiles. And so when I say volatiles, that means when things come out of solution and form gas. So an example of this would be lava fountains, which is where it has clots of lava rain that fall down onto the volcano from the fountains. We have lapilli, which are droplets of golf ball sized fragments of glassy lava and scoria. We have bombs, which are um, lobes of lava that squirt out of a vent and then solidify. Uh, the surfaces are typically streaked and polished. And bombs can be quite large. They can be like the size of a basketball and even larger. And blocks are erupting basalt masses uh, that are ripped off from larger fragments of already solid lava from the walls of the vent. And then they get ejected. So blocks are quite large. Okay, so what about pyroclastic debris flows from andesitic or rhyolitic eruptions? So again, remember that andesitic and rhyolitic eruptions are more viscous than basalt flows. And so they generally have uh, more gas. So we see things like ash, and this is where debris is ejected during explosive eruptions. And those are particles less than two millimeters in diameter. Uh, this is like, would create um, large disruptions in the sky. Like you just have like really thin ash everywhere. 
Uh, next is a pyroclastic flow, which is exploding flow that rushes down the flank of a volcano in an avalanche-like current. And we have tuff, which is tephra from andesitic or rhyolitic eruptions when they're buried and then transformed into a coherent rock. So these are just like masses um, of, of flow and eruption that um, just come together as they cool and, and form a coherent rock. Okay, so a volcanic debris flow in Lahar. So a volcanic debris flow is where volcanoes are covered with snow and ice or with rain, and the water can, um, can act with this debris um, from a flow. And a lahar is an ash rich debris, which becomes wet and soupy um, and creates a slurry. And this can reach very high speeds. So let's look at an example of a lahar. So that lahar is pretty crazy because it moves so quickly. And when it mixes with ash, I imagine that that, um, that that solution is quite soupy and can be really scary if you're close by. Okay, so let's talk about volcanic gas and aerosols. Volcanic gases come out of solution when the magma approaches the Earth's surface and pressure decreases. Just as bubbles come out of solution when you open a soda pop and you, you twi untwist the lid and it releases gas, that's just like how volcanic gases work when they reach their surface. Aerosols are tiny droplets of sulfuric acid. Uh, sulfuric acid is found in the, uh, in the subsurface. So when the gases come up to the surface, we get sulfuric acid. Low viscosity magma, um, like gas, uh, gas bubbles can rise faster than the magma moves. Some volcanoes erupt a lot of gas without erupting lava. So you could have an example of, 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 of just a lot of gas coming out of, um, out of a volcano without a lot of flow or without a lot of um, other explosive materials. Some lava can still have gas bubbles. So when it freezes, the bubbles are trapped in the rock and create holes called vesicles. So here's a vesicular rock sample here on the right. You can see all these little air bubbles uh, that, remained, uh, that remained there as the rock cooled. And that's why we have this uh, huge porosity, this, these large um, holes within the rock. Okay, let's talk about volcano structure. Um, we have a crater, which is a circular bowl-like depression that occurs at the top of a, of a volcanic edifice. And they can be quite large. They can be 500 meters across and 200 meters deep. And they're formed during the eruption or just after a volcanic eruption. We also have a caldera. Uh, this is a large magma chamber beneath the volcano. And this can drain suddenly um, the circular depression is much larger than the crater, and it's typically partially filled with ash or solidified lava. So inside a crater is typically where we see a caldera. Okay, let's talk about the different types of volcanoes. We have cinder cone, shield, composite or stratovolcano, and lava dome. Okay, first, cinder cone. This is formed uh, when explosive activity throws magma into the air and cools into cinders and settles around the volcanoes. 
Uh, so usually it's created from a single opening and the opening is cone shape. You can see that here in this picture on the right from SP Crater in Arizona near Flagstaff. And when the lava erupts, uh, cinders of it are blown into the air. Fragmented cinders fall a short distance creating a cone. So you can see here the flow as a result of um, the eruption of this volcano. So that looks quite different than a shield volcano. And uh, over multiple eruptions, long fluid lava flows form broad layers which accumulate. And typically shield volcanoes are some of the world's largest volcanoes. So you can see that the slope of this is significantly more gradual than the last one. And that's because it erupts many times um, over geologic history. <clears throat> They're tall, but tend to be broad with less steep slope. So this example is a shield volcano in Iceland. Okay, composite. Um, over multiple eruptions, the accumulation of both explosive activity and lava flows form very steep and sweeping sides of a volcano. As it ages, there's multiple channels on the surface that can splinter off and um, into a central vent and, and influence the shape. So it's not quite as symmetrical. And because it erupts over multiple times, we have um, preferential flow and changes uh, on the exterior of the volcano. These uh, composite volcanoes typically have some of the most dangerous eruptions and they are very tall. Um, and while they're symmetrical, they have a lot of variation on uh, the sides. So here's an example from Mount Rainier. You can see uh, that there's multiple channels on the outside of the volcano of where there have been multiple eruptions. Okay, last is lava dome. This is uh, forms when thick, extremely viscous lava erupts and hardens in a dome shape. These emerge in one active period. And afterwards, uh, they're usually extinct, but may occur on the side of a larger volcano. And lava domes are typically a bit smaller. They're formed when lava is too viscous to flow a great distance. And so as it slowly grows, the lava continues to pile within and it creates this large mound. And lava domes are found on the flanks of larger composite volcanoes. So a lava dome um, here is this, this, this dome in, uh, near Mount St. Helens. Okay, so we have two different types of eruptive style. We have effusive and explosive. So effusive is where lava pours out from a vent or fissure and it fills a lava lake around the crater, or it flows in molten rivers for great distances. So here's that basalt lava flow example from Hawaii. This would be effusive. This is very slow and gradual um, versus the, the opposite of that, which is explosive. And this is where pressure builds up and a small explosion takes place and it scatters lava drops and blobs upwards. So here's an example from the Philippines of um, a huge amount of ash and gases that are erupted into the atmosphere. So let's take a look at some more volcanic eruptions. Volcanoes have helped shape our planet. They provide life, but also can take life away. Here's our list of the top five volcano eruptions caught on camera. At number five, we have Mexico's Popocatepetl volcano, which erupted in 2013. Popocatepetl erupts every few years. Nearby residents have learned to stay well clear of this volcano. Last year, Mount Shindig erupted in Japan, which covered nearby towns in ash and dust for weeks. Luckily, the volcano is situated on an island, so most of the magma flowed safely into the ocean below. These mountain climbers are certainly lucky to be alive after Mount Kushino Arabajima erupted in Japan. They quickly take cover behind rocks to shield themselves from the elements. 
やばいねこれ下がるもっと<音楽>あ行こう行こうみんなじゃあどうしましょう<笑>コスタリカのトリオバ volcano が噴火しましたが、誰も死んでいないので、周辺の大学や学校も閉鎖されていたので、その後、噴火が終わりましたが、噴火が終わりました。Perhaps the most famous of all volcanoes, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. 57 people died in this eruption, making it one of the most deadly volcano eruptions in modern times. Please subscribe for more top 5 videos, or check out my previous top 5 video on oddly satisfying videos. Oh man, that video is a little bit stressful, but isn't it cool to be a geologist? It's like, yeah, volcanoes, woo! All right, well, maybe you're. Uh, YouTube search history is sufficient enough that more volcanoes pop up as your recommendations. Okay, let's talk more about volcanoes and plate tectonics. So I mentioned this last lecture, um, and this is just a little bit of reminder of the relationship between volcanoes and plate tectonics because it's really important. So here's a map of um, the uh, of where all the volcanoes are around the world, and um, is every little triangle here represents a volcano, and we see volcanoes. At hotspots, subduction zones, mid-ocean ridges, and rifts. Okay, so let's uh, talk about hotspots.、Um, this is an isolated point where a column of very hot rock, rock rises up through the mantle, called a mantle plume, and the plume reaches the base of the lithosphere and creates a, a mafic magma. And these are effusive, typically.、Um, those are slow basalts,、uh, basaltic flows. And we can also see submarine slumps. So, in the igneous rock lecture, I talked about Hawaii, but Iceland is also an example of a hotspot. This is created at the crest of the mid ocean ridge. So, if you go to Iceland, you can、um, actually dive or snorkel and stand right between、uh, the two plate boundaries.、Um, we see volcanoes at a subduction zone.、Um, Where volcanic arcs form in the overriding plate adjacent to the deep ocean trenches that mark convergent plate boundaries. And the subduction zone carries crust down into the asthenosphere. The crust warms up and it becomes so hot and volatile that it separates. 
And this is where we get volcanic arts. So remember at a subduction zone, we have the two plates coming together and one pushes under. And, uh, and this is where we get that convection going within the asthenosphere so that the plate, um, as it cools, it, uh, it sinks. And as it heats up, it rises. Um, in continental volcanic arcs, not all mantle drive basaltic bomb, uh, magma rises directly to the surface. Some of it gets trapped at the base of the continental crust and some resides in the magma chambers. And we see this typically around the ring of fire, um, which is the long chain around the Pacific plate in the Pacific Ocean. So you can see here um, all these little triangles represent all of the volcanoes around the ring of fire. We see volcanoes at mid-ocean ridges as well. Um, and this is where we have a divergent plate boundary, which causes seafloor to spread. And this is where the asthenosphere rises beneath the ridge and begins to melt. And this can form things like pillow mounds and create hydrothermal vents. Um, and uh, that's known as black smokers along the mounds. So here's an example of pillow basalt um, at Golden Gate Recreational Area near the bay. So we see volcanoes at rifts as well. And rifts occur where horizontal stretching of continental lithosphere takes place. And as a result, the lithosphere also uh, thins vertically. Partial melting due to decompression produces basaltic magma, which rises into the crust. So this can create lava fountains or linear chains of cinder cones. An example of a volcano at a rift would be Mount Kilimanjaro. You can see that it's, um, while large, it's also quite broad. So when we think about volcanic hazards, what are some things that come to mind? Well, first is being burned alive from a flow. That would not be pleasant. But you could also have um, threat of falling ash or lapilly. You could have ash in the air, which creates a lot of breathing problems. Um, you can have uh, a hazard of, uh, as a result of the blast itself. Um, we talked about lahars, but there's also landslides that can occur. Uh, volcanoes can also produce earthquakes and tsunamis. And of course, we talked about aerosols and gas and sulfuric gas that can be emitted from a volcano. And those are all things that you don't want to breathe. So these are a list of some of the volcanic hazards um, that are associated with volcanic eruptions. So we talk about what uh, different types of volcanoes there are. We usually say they're active, dormant, or extinct. So what are the differences between those three? Well, first, an active volcano means that it could erupt soon. And uh, dormant means that it hasn't erupted for hundreds of thousands of years, but may possibly erupt again in the future. And ex extinct means that it's shut off entirely and uh, will never erupt again. So when we talk about what soon means, we have to think about this in terms of geologic time. So soon to you and me might be a year or, you know, uh, 50 years. Um, but in geologic time, sometimes we talk about soon being hundreds of years. Um, and so an active volcano may not have been active just in the last year, but it could erupt within 50 to 100 to a few hundred years. Dormant means that it hasn't erupted. Um, but could erupt within the next hundreds or thousands of years. So we have to think about what geologic time scale means in the context of volcanoes. So let's talk about an active volcano, uh, Mount Etna in Italy. Actually, it was May 2020, uh, not too long ago, where uh, Mount Etna erupted again. An example of a dormant volcano, a volcano is Mount Kilimanjaro. This is somewhat active currently. There's some sulfur and steam that are coming from a vent. However, the last volcanic eruption occurred around 200,000 years ago. So again, this is talking about uh, what geologic soon means. So it's possible that Mount Kilimanjaro may um, erupt again because there's a little bit of activity, even though it hasn't had a full eruption for over 200,000 years. And what about extinct? So this, uh, this volcano is in Peru, Huascaran, Peru, and this volcano continues to get smaller and smaller. Um, I couldn't find a whole lot of info on the last dated eruption, but there's no indication of last activity in the last 10,000 years. 
So the differences uh, between this one and Mount Kilimanjaro is that even though Mount Kilimanjaro hasn't been erupted for 200,000 years, there's somewhat of uh, indication that there's activity still happening, meaning that there is steam and sulfur that's coming out of a vent versus this, continue, uh, this volcano continues to get smaller and smaller. So even though it has erupted more recently, there's no signs of it uh, potentially erupting again. So can we predict volcano eruptions? Uh, well, let's take a look and watch this YouTube video. Volcanoes are unpredictable forces of nature, and there are about 1,500 geologically active ones around the world. Let that sink in. This one, Bardabunga in Iceland, spewed thousands of cubic feet of molten lava from a crack in the Earth's crust back in 2014. By volcanologist standards, that was considered a peaceful eruption. Peaceful. Hm. Bardabunga could erupt explosively again one day, shutting down air travel and unleashing a level of environmental destruction that would wipe out roads and homes and daily life as we know it. Active volcanoes like this one exist all over the world, but active is sort of a misnomer. An active volcano can erupt at any time, but it also could not. That's the nature of these bubbling cauldrons. They're incredibly dangerous and mystifying and so hard to predict. Scientists are working hard to figure out exactly when a volcano is going to erupt. The best we can do now is whittle a prediction down to a series of probabilities and best guesses. And to do this, volcanologists have a few things in their toolkit. Seismometers that can pinpoint the rise and fall of magma, thermal imaging to detect the heat around a volcano, and chemical sensors that sniff for volcanic gases like sulfur and CO2. Even with all of these data points, though, there's still no such thing as a volcano forecast. No one can say that this will erupt in so many days. As they work towards getting a forecast, scientists are adding another tool into their toolkit, seismic noise interferometry. It's like listening to the whispers of a volcano. Let's break that down, though. In a study, researchers analyzed seismic noise moving through the volcano Kilauea in Hawaii over a four-year period. Seismic noises are low-level vibrations in the Earth. They come from things like earthquakes or ocean waves. In this case, magma swirling inside a volcano. By using seismic noise interferometry, the researchers measured the speed of seismic activity moving through a volcano. They were able to record how fast the vibrations were traveling and then isolated the noise, or whispers, coming from inside. By isolating the seismic noise, scientists were able to identify the sounds that indicate an increase in internal pressure, which is a warning sign for a future eruption. Going one step further, the researchers compared those results to a second set of data, which measured the bulging and shrinking of a volcano's summit over time. Kilauea is a very active volcano. As the pressure in its magma chamber increases and decreases, it is constantly bulging and shrinking. This makes it a prime candidate for this kind of research. The researchers found a correlation between the speed of this volcano's seismic energy and the bulging and shrinking. As the magma fills up, it causes an increase in pressure, which produces much faster seismic waves, and volcanoes tend to bulge up and out before an eruption. So, by combining these two data sets, researchers were more able to accurately predict when an eruption could happen. Technical improvements like these are bringing volcanologists one step closer to understanding the inner workings of these explosive mountains and the behaviors that lead to a massive eruption. We've still got more work to do, but predicting chaos is getting that much more precise. What I like about this video is that the title is Volcanic Whispers, which is a very cutesy um, way to describe what microseismic is. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more later in the semester about seismicity and what um, microseismic is in the context of earthquakes, but uh, it's definitely applicable to predicting um, volcanic eruptions. And if you happen to go someplace that has um, any volcanic activity, you would see these little um, seismometers everywhere that predict small ground movements, these microseismic whisper activities. So if you think that predicting volcanoes is cool, then you think that geophysics is cool, and I would agree. All right, so let's look at where volcanoes are near you. So I'm going to show my desktop here. Okay, so let's look at where some volcanoes are uh, here in North America. So let's 
zoom in. Does this already surprise you that there's volcanoes here that you didn't know existed? Maybe you would have um, read in the news about some of the volcanoes around Alaska, but there's quite a few volcanoes um, here in California. So let's look at first what the scale is. So this is ground-based volcano alert levels. So um, white means, um, or clear, no fill, is unmonitored. So these are likely dormant or extinct volcanoes. Green means um, uh, normal. <laughs> Yellow is advisory. And um, this orangish is increasing level of concern with watch. And uh, red alert is warning. So those are the, the levels of scariness with these volcanoes. So just here in California, we can see that we're all, we're all green. So um, where is the closest volcano to us near Southern California? Well, depending on where you are in Southern California, you might say it's uh, down here near the Sultan Sea, near Sultan Buttes, but let's look at this guy over here. This is Coso Volcanic Field. Um, let's click on this him and see. So, What's really nice about this website is that you can um, look at all these different volcanoes and uh, select information about them and they'll pull up more information about that specific volcano. So look, I selected Coso Volcanic Field and we can see where it's located. We can uh, learn a little bit more about any of its um, recent activity or seismicity. It has some information about seismic monitoring on this earthquake. So let's go back and let's find an earthquake that is uh, showing us a, an orange or red warning. Okay, so we have some yellow, which is increasing level advisory up here in Alaska. And so this part of Alaska, that's part of that ring of fire that I was explaining earlier. So now if we go down to Hawaii, we can see that uh, Hawaii is uh, just a yellow advisory. And this is the current um, current active volcano here on uh, the Big Island. So I recommend you check out this website if you find this interesting and maybe you'll learn something new about volcanoes near you. So let's go back to our presentation and let's talk about volcanoes not near you. So both Mars and Venus display distinct volcanic edifices, some of which have calderas at their peak. So here's an infrared image of um, a plume of active volcanic activity on Io. And how cool is that that we're able to image that? So uh, Io is one of the uh, moons of Jupiter. So there aren't volcanoes just on Earth. We observe them on other planets. OK, so how much do I love volcanoes? I love volcanoes so much that this is actually me really smiling. Um, I have a map in my hand, so you know that I'm an earth scientist in some way because earth scientists just like naturally carry maps with them. And I'm literally jumping for joy. So this is me at Volcano National Park in the Big Island of Hawaii. And I was so pumped to see an active volcano. Um, and I really think volcanoes are cool. So I hope you find them cool too. Okay, so what did we learn in this lecture? Lava flow is dependent on viscosity. We have four major types of volcanoes, cinder cone, shield, composite, and lava dome. There's two types of eruptions. We see effusive, which is the slow and gradual, and explosive, which is the very violent uh, eruptions. Different kinds of volcanoes form in different geologic settings, as explained by plate tectonics. Volcanoes have many hazards, as we saw in those YouTube videos, that if you uh, came close to one of those lahars or a basalt flow itself, that would be very dangerous. Uh, volcanoes exist on other planets, and there's lots of active volcanoes in the world right now. So that's it for this lecture. I have a few other recommended videos that um, I hope you consider checking out because they're super cool to watch. See you next time.